Hello and welcome to the symposium. My name's Carl, and today I'm going to be talking about the the Enlightenment triad, the three big tent ideologies that came out of the Enlightenment, and how they connect to one another, and why each ideology hates the other and views the opposite as being the same. For example, a liberal might say, well, a communist and a fascist look the same. A fascist might say a liberal and a communist look the same. And a communist might say a liberal and a fascist look the same. And why? Why do they do that? And the, this is a really important question, I think, because it really hits to the heart of why essentially very little point is, is uh, very little progress is made in online debates. Because I think there's a fundamental misunderstanding of each person's uh, desires and positions, and a kind of an attempt to trap people into the opposing position. So you might talk to a communist if you're a liberal and say, well, hang on a second, I think open borders are a bad idea. And they'll say, ha, I knew you were a fascist, but the liberal isn't a fascist. And why why does this happen? And so I think I can help explain this. I think I can actually do some good here. Um, so we begin with the, the the French Revolution, in fact. We'll, we'll take this from the position of the French Revolution. Uh, start with liberty, egality, fraternity. I think that's how it's all pronounced, although my French is terrible. But liberty, equality, and um, fraternity. And I think people are pushed towards these things by desires. I think there's a reason why when there's uh, a, a catastrophe or an invasion or something like that, the, the, the left are tend to be afraid that people are going to become fascists and the fascist right will grow when there are ethnic concerns. Uh, I think people are pushed into these by various kinds of desires. People who view the world as being very unfair tend to want uh, socialism. People who tend to want freedom, trend towards liberalism, and those who want security want fascism. Uh, all three are very class-conscious ideologies, and I'm not going to be talking about the actual numbers of the people in each group either. I'm just talk talking uh, academically about the core beliefs of each philosophy and how they intersect with one another. So, beginning with liberalism, it obviously desires liberty. Uh, the mechanism for this is constitutional restrictions on the state and a free market in which people can buy and sell the goods that they personally own. Uh, this is the night watchman model of the state. The aim is towards the protection of the individual's rights. The state has no ethical agenda of its own, and so the concern for equality of people is only under the rule of law. Uh, society over which the state governs is to be the arbiter of the ethical decisions itself. It's not going to be dictated from the top down, it's going to be dictated bottom up. Uh, but anyway, the, the liberalism itself is a class conscious ideology. It came about to end hereditary aristocratic privileges, and it essentially was the revolution of the bourgeoisie towards the end of the Middle Ages. Socialism is, has evolved out of liberalism from a desire for equality, and it appears to be absolute equality, at least materially. It's an entirely materialistic philosophy, uh, and socialism itself is a necessary mechanism by which to achieve communism. So really, I could, I could just use the term socialism and communism interchangeably, but I'm going to use socialism uh, just for the sake of it, although I'll try to make sure I don't use the term communism, but that what socialism is just on the process to becoming communism. It marks revolu Marx's revolutionary view. Um, through various amounts of brainwashing, the, co the, the, the communist or the socialist believes that the state will wither away, leaving us a stateless, classless, propertyless society, which has never happened. Uh, concern for material equality is viewed exclusively through the lens of class. Um, the the fact that the there is supposed to be a revolution in which the proletariat rise up against the bourgeoisie, assume control of the means of production, collectivize them so they're owned by the state, uh, seems to be somewhat of a paradox. The, the You can see where the stopping point is here. Why doesn't the state then wither away? Well, it's in total control of everything. Why would it wither away? The people involved in running it tend to have to express quite a lot of force in order to keep that state of affairs, and so they make a lot of enemies. So perhaps their absolute power becoming slightly less than absolute might be dangerous to their position. Anyway, all property is owned by the state, and the ethical agenda is to ensure proletarian domination to pave the way for communism. It's obviously class conscious, it seeks to overthrow the other classes using the proletariat. And then you come to fascism, which evolved out of socialism, out of the apparent failures of socialism. And if you look at what happened with socialism, it became, well, essentially what the fascists desired to be. Um, fascism desires perfection. It de 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 desires 
competence and excellence and competitiveness. Uh, the purpose is to outcompete the other nations and empires for the supremacy of the world. Now, the Nazis substituted the German race instead of the citizen uh, to as a component of the state. Um, I'm going to use fascism as a blanket term for all sorts of uh, types of fascist thought, including Nazism. Um, again, because honestly, I mean, fascist is a pejorative anyway, but Nazi and communist are, see, seem to be worse pejoratives than fascist and socialist to me, because fascist and socialist at least have some kind of like independent theoretical grounds from philosophy, uh, even if they're I don't agree with either of them, by the way. Um, but I think it's important that everyone understands these things. Um, so, again, it's for security and greatness. And the mechanism for this is the veneration of the state. Uh, this is Mussolini's uh, maxim. Uh, everything within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. And so that means that all people within the nation, every citizen, is a component of the state now and is subject to its will. And the... The, the, I mean, the fascists coined the term totalitarian, and so they, they have an ethical agenda to perfect society into a godlike state, uh, because the state and society are now the same thing. Every individual is subservient to the state, and all things should be put in accordance to drive towards that perfection of that state. And this is in the, the excellence of the individual is in service to all of these other things. Um, they believe in a class hierarchy, as, as uh, other Enlightenment ideologies do, but instead of seeking to abolish it, they seek to expand it through various conquests and uh, over subject peoples. Um, and, it, and like I said, it came about because of the failures of socialism. Um, and so liberalism, socialism and fascism often reflect upon the following lines. Uh, on the subject of property rights, uh, liberalism is based on property rights and desires above all the protection of these property rights with you being your own property at the end of the day. Uh, and anything that you mix your labour with in nature is then your property. Uh, the socialists, of course, wish to abolish property rights. I think you can say the, and the, the liberals, the, the creation of liberal property rights comes from John Locke. His pick up of an acorn and then suddenly the acorn becomes your property because you mixed it with your labour. Uh, the socialist wishes to abolish property rights. I'd say that probably originally comes from Rousseau in The Social Contract where he laments how the first person who ever staked out a patch of ground and called it his, everyone should have torn it up and said, no, this is evil. Um, but this then carries on to evolve into... Uh, sort of French liberalism and then socialism, this line of thought. And uh, then you get to fascism, which doesn't particularly care about property rights as as the socialists and liberals uh, view them. The, the fascist views everything to be owned by the state. That includes the individuals themselves who would, uh, you know, theoretically own property. So the property is not something separate to the the citizen, which is not something separate to the state. So the fascists don't really care about property rights. They don't see how unfree individuals can make free use of their own property. Uh, so th that's not really something the fascists spend all too much time focused on. Uh, on the subject of markets, liberalism obviously likes free mar markets. The more laissez-faire, the better. Socialism wishes state-controlled markets, which is what they call state capitalism, as a mechanism to eventually outmode money altogether through well, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's what we'd call a command economy, but it's, you know, state-directed labour, and eventually they expect you not to be paid for it. Uh, fascism achieves the same thing, but to ensure the party's grip on power and just to ensure their complete control over every aspect of the state. Uh, again, the, the fascists don't really have a deep political theory about markets. They just see them as a kind of vulnerability to which um, other outside forces can start... Uh, doing damage to the to the state themselves, and um, they they may even use the term parasites at some point uh, to to imply that you know control of money can be um, something that is detrimental to the state itself. Um, now, the way they view the state itself, in fact, uh, liberalism tends to view it as a necessary evil. Socialism views it as a temporary evil, then abolished under communism, and fascism views it as the ultimate goal. 
So you can see how these things are completely different in some respects and how they are not so different in others. Uh, and when it comes to power distribution, liberalism prefers a parliamentary or republican style democracy. Socialism prefers a one party single class democracy, as in the people get to vote are the proletariats who are part of the party, which is why the the socialist regimes of the 20th century and now tend to look so much like the fascist regimes the the fascists had no interest in democracy but when you've narrowed the the democratic base to party members who agree with with the uh, the communist revolution then effectively you have had to gulag or exile or shoot so many people liberals and, and fascists that, I mean, you could hardly consider this to be a democracy at this point. And fascism just openly desires the end of democracy and the exaltation of a leader. Um, so on the concept of citizenship, liberalism views it as an essential component of the state. The citizens are the thing that the state is built upon and meant to serve. The, the citizens create the state for their, for their own purposes, for defence, uh, enforcement of contracts, rule of law, things like this. Socialism views it as arbitrary and unnecessary. The purpose of socialism is communism, which means a worldwide class revolution and the abolition of states themselves, and therefore citizenship. Uh, fascism views each citizen as a direct extension of the state itself, a reversal of the liberal order. Um, under the state's power, beholden to the state, because it is the state that gives the citizen life. The state is the continuous thing that exists through time and space, from which which provides the protection and the, the, the fertile ground under which the citizen can be born. So the citizen has an obligation to the state in this way. So I think that this is enough information to explain why communists look like fascists to liberals, and why liberals look like communists to fascists, and why liberals look like fascists to communists. The liberals oppose the idea of the destruction of the state, the nation, and the citizen. And so the liberal finds himself in alliance with the fascist, who considers them vital components of political life, even while having vastly different views on how these things should be considered. The socialist looks at the liberal's defense of the nation-state as a form of soft fascism, which they think will inevitably slide down the scale into outright racial nationalism. This is ironic, given how the socialist wishes to appropriate all property, but still on the socialist position, they would say they wish to do it to end the oppression of the bourgeoisie. But they, they find themselves aligned with the also class-conscious liberal against the fascists' elitist intentions. The liberal's conception of liberty is built on the idea of free men owning their own property, though, and so the socialist's plan to collectivise the means of production sounds like mass slavery. The fascist has no particular problem with mass slavery, but intends on collectivising the people themselves, which makes their property an extension of the state by proxy. However, the, the fascist and the socialist completely disagree on the purpose of this aggregation of state power, and so despise each other like vengeful siblings. Socialist democracy requires the extermination of fascist elements, which essentially means anything outside of the party. The liberals' desire for equality although equality of a different kind from the socialist, looks like communism to the fascist because it's a rejection of the natural order of mankind, where a small elite dominate the masses. The masses are stupid, and without the guidance of the ethical state will never improve, survive, and thrive in the great competition that is life. And finally, the liberal looks at the anti-constitutional plans of the communist and fascist and realises that they are a lamb in a room with two revolutionary wolves who both despises, despise liberalism's individualistic approach, the free market, decentralised power distribution, and a general hands-off approach to their own population and are about to decide what to do about it. These big tent ideological positions, I think, will forever dominate Enlightenment thinking, and if we're going to work within this framework, then there is essentially no point accusing someone of being that which they don't actually claim to be, because it probably stems from one of these confusions, one of these conflicting desires that liberalism and fascism share, or fascism and communism share, or communism and liberalism share, etc., and the wheel goes around. Anyway, I hope this was useful for when you're next navigating your own online political discussions, because I've obviously engaged in many, many of these, and these are, I think, the primary distinctions about what 
uh, can and can't be done that categorize people. And I'm, I'm just frankly tired of people trying to say, you're an X or you're a Y. Let people self-identify, and we can identify why people disagree on certain things without calling them names.